I want to say the right words at the right time in the right way. How about you? She asked her husband, Paul Young, to do just that. Uh, Paul was raised by missionary parents attempting to bring the virtues of Christianity to a Stone Age New Zealand tribe. He comes from a Western evangelical Protestant tradition, but his take on Christianity and how it's formulated is different. Knowing that difference, that he thinks outside of the box, she asked him if he would take his writings, his idea, and put them in one place, deposit them in one box, where the children would have access to them as they got older. He then set an intention to make that a Christmas present. In longhand on yellow legal pads, while writing Metro to three jobs, he began writing what he thought made it a story. Uh, when he finished it, he went to Office Depot and made photocopies of each of the pages, bought uh, spiral notebooks and put the pages in the notebook, made it just enough for the six kids, other members of the family, and a few friends. That was his aspiration. That's what he wanted to contribute. And nothing made him happier than that Christmas morning when he handed that off to the kids. Uh, he learned later that his wife was hoping for four to six pages. Uh, it became a 225-page novel we now know as The Shack that has sold 20 million copies around the world. It's slightly a different take on the incarnation and how God becomes present to us. His latest book is called Lies We Believe About God. It started as a series of tweets, series of tweets in which he says, these are the things you will never hear God say. He has a list of 125. A few of them I thought I'd share with you. You will never hear God say, you are the child I never wanted. You'll never hear God say, I will let you keep your most precious lies. You'll never hear God say, you overestimated Jesus. You'll never hear God say, I need you. I want to say the right thing at the right time in the right way. I want my words to be helpful, but there are words a child's ear should never hear coming out of the mouth of an angry adult. The National Committee on Child Abuse has made a record of what they know kids hear in abusive settings. When parents or adults say, you're pathetic, you can't do anything right, you disgust me, just shut up. Hey, stupid, don't you know how to listen? You're more trouble than you're worth. Get out of here. I don't want to see your face. I wish you had never been born. As much as I want to say the right words at the right time, I know there are words that sting and wound, and the wounds can last a lifetime. Isaac Asimov, who's written over 400 novels, at the age of 15 was in an English class and the assignment was a writing assignment. All of them were turned on, his was turned in, his was chosen to be one of the ones the teacher would read. And the teacher could not get all the way through without making a comment and his comment was, this is the most sophomoric piece of writing I have ever read. It is an embarrassment. He was wounded by those words concluded they were right, that he was trying too hard and the writing wasn't the right thing. At the end of the year, he wrote another piece, submitted that, and it was published in the yearbook at the end of the year. He went to the teacher at the end of the year to say, thank you so much for publishing what I had written. And he said, all that. Everybody else wrote something serious, and I just needed a light, inconsequential piece to put at the end of the book. Fifty years later, more than 50 years later, at the age of 70, when he has been diagnosed with cancer, Asimov still remembers that event and describes him as the only man he still hates. Words can sting and wound. I want to say the right words. We want to say the right words. And we do most of the time. Like, we know how to say, hi, how are you? 
you're looking great. Lost weight? How is the summer? How are the kids? How are your parents? What are you doing these days? Hi, please. Thank you. We know the social currency and the social cues that click in the words that may sound like cliches, but they keep conversation and bonds going. We do great until there's a tragedy, when there's a bad diagnosis or somebody dies, and when we find ourselves there, many of us have had safe enough lives that this doesn't happen very often, so we don't know what words to form. We don't want to do damage. We want want to do pain. As a matter of fact, we want to dismiss the pain and say, I know it looks really bad, but it's not as bad as you think. Don't we? The idea that the world is chaotic and that their pain could become mine is sometimes more than I can bear. And I want them to know they don't have to worry about it happening again. So I want to dismiss the pain, but dismissing the pain can be the worst thing you do for somebody who's suffering, to tell them that it doesn't matter. So if I say things like, they're better off now, Everything happens for a reason. God will never give you more than you can handle. It just, it, it just sometimes doesn't work. Imagine me in Richmond at a hospital, and a young couple is having their first baby, twins. After 40 hours of labor, the four-and-a-half-pound babies are born. Great health, put in the NIC unit, put in the cribs that are part of what's in the NIC unit. Mother goes to her room and the dad goes home for the night. When they arrive in the morning, I meet them and we learn that one of the babies didn't make it through the night. Which of the phrases should I tell them? They're better off now. Everything happens for a reason. God will not give you more than you can bear. The end is going to be so easy that this pain won't matter. This pain won't matter. What else does matter? Can you imagine if you were present on 9-11, if the Twin Towers were hit or the Pentagon was hit, and people are running into the building to try to save those they love, if you say, don't do it, they're better off now. This all happens for a reason. God won't give us more than we can handle. To make the proclamation that that pain doesn't matter is simply to be deaf and dumb. It is not paying attention to what's right in front of you. It deserves our attention. So I, I want to look at where this idea, particularly the phrase, God will not give you more than you can handle, because it seems to be the most religious of all the phrases you can say. Something that easily comes out of your mouth. It feels as if it's being faithful to some kind of tradition, and you hope it does healing magically, like superstition to the people who hear it. I'll speak the truth, and they'll get all better. So I want to kind of look at that passage again and see what's behind it, because I think it's different than we imagine. And then I want to offer an alternative Thing we can say. And then I want to tell you what I've witnessed some of you do when there are tragedies uh, and your presence is important. You ready? Okay. I'm going to read again the passage from Corinthians. It's uh, 1 Corinthians, that love book, and it's uh, the 10th chapter. Uh, let you know, Corinth is a prosperous port city filled with lots and lots of people from all over the world. It's a cosmopolitan, sophisticated, educated town. And the people that live in it come from many different places. And now that they have made Corinth their home, they have set up temples where people go to worship multiple gods. Gods that are served by the slaughtering of meat so that if you have meat for your family, it most assuredly was sacrificed to an idol before it made its way to your plate. Um, there are temple prostitutes that make the temple worship a more attractive option for some people. It is Corinth where Paul has been making a journey, and on his journey he has stopped and started a small congregation, a religious community following the teachings of Jesus. And the teachings of Jesus aren't the same as the pagan ideas that are making that culture work. It's different. And he writes constantly to Corinth because they have taken on a way of life that's an alternative to the community around them, the culture around them. They're finding a different life. But it is tempting to leave the life of Jesus and go back to the things that are so enticing. That's the reason he writes the letter. 
because he knows that the witness to Jesus Christ only exists in that community through that church. And he doesn't want them to abandon it because it's not just for their sake, but for the sake of all the people. So he writes to them to not give in to the temptations of the culture that surrounds them. Here's how he says it again. Ready? I'll start with the 12th verse. So if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not only allow you to be tested. He, let's me again. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength, but with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. It's about the testing of temptation, not the placing of burdens upon our backs. Do you get the difference? It's the testing of temptations. As a matter of fact, he says, in the middle of temptation, God is the one who's faithful, who will show you a way out, a way out of the testing, a way out of the problem, not to see if you can take more. I mean, if we have a list of 125 things you'll never hear God say, maybe we should have a list of 125 things you know God will never do. That if Jesus gave us the golden rule, do unto others as you would have others do unto you, we should imagine that God is going to do unto us as God would have us do unto each other. The idea that God has this list of pains and sorrows he's going to heap upon us. He's just deciding which of us is strong enough to take it. That of all the work God can do of the seven billion people on the planet, what he's made his main focus of attention is to see how much pain I can give you to see if you can take it. Is that like the craziest idea of God? When the 23rd Psalm is written, it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I never, it never crossed my mind that what that meant was, God is the evil wolf who wants to devour me. No, God is the good shepherd who wants to protect me. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, not meaning I'm here to inflict pain. I don't know of one story in which Jesus goes around the countryside and puts leprosy or disease upon people, but instead he lifts the burden that they've received. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, the ones that are burdened, and I will give you not more burden, I will give you rest. The Lord is our helper and our strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. The words of the psalmist. Our God is the God who comes beside us. Our God is the one who's willing to attend to us. A God who's willing to submit to us. Who will take God's cues from you and me. And when Jesus saw that the cue was that he needed to share in our death, he didn't consider himself above it, but he entered into it so that we could be saved. So maybe instead of saying, God will not give you more than you can handle, we could say uh, with Adam Hamilton, God will help you handle anything that life gives you. What do you think? So I'll give you some things I've watched you and other congregations do when there is a tragedy. What I, what I don't want to be is like a young couple who uh, on a romantic weekend got in a hot air balloon. Uh, winds picked up, a storm came and blew them off course. They had no idea where they were. They then lowered the balloon to about 20 yards off the ground looking for somebody who could help them. They found somebody and they said, help! And the person said, what do you need? And they said, where are we? And the man put his hand on his chin and looked at him and said, you are in a hot air balloon. <laughs> and the woman said, you must be a minister. And he well, yes, how did you know? He said, well, what you've said is absolutely true and absolutely worthless. <laughs> so I don't want to do that, right? I don't want to say a truth that is worthless or maybe causes pain. So here's some of the things I've watched you do. Here's some of the things I watched you do. And, and I you can take it from the story we heard about Moses, 
where Moses has become a judge and you have thousands of people in line. They're worn out because they have to stand in line so long to talk to Moses. And Moses is worn out because he can't do this all day by himself. And what his father-in-law tells him is you just got to get more people to help you. You got to expand the circle. You don't have to do it alone. And there are lots of people who need to be told, go see the doctor, go see a therapist, go to the grocery store, let me uh, get some milk for you, let me mow your grass, let me watch the pets while you go out of town, let me water your plants, let me... There's something that you need that I can provide. Let's expand the circle. You don't have to do this alone. So here's how I talk about expanding the circle. So when you find out that somebody's hurting, you kind of enter their space. Uh, not, not maybe this close. But... <laughs> So you enter somebody else, that is, you're willing to be present with them. Because the greatest way to let somebody know they're not alone is for you presently to be in their space. That's how they know. It is not the words that you say that make your presence worthwhile. It's just you. Your presence, your presence changes the circle in which they are bearing their burden alone. Just your presence. You got it? Other things I've watched you do is when you're in the presence, you say, tell me what it's like. Not, I know what you're going through. Because you don't. <laughs> you know what you went through when you went through the very same thing, but that doesn't mean you know what it's like for them. The only way you'll know is by listening. What's it like? Expand the circle. How's everybody else doing? Brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles. How's the family doing? So you're checking to see if they're connected, if the circle is larger. Uh, another thing I've watched you do, tell me more about them. If they've lost somebody, whether it's a child, mother, grandparent, a best friend, tell me about them. And let them just get out of the way um, because the story is how they recover the good memories of this person so that the only thing left in their life is not the pain of that person's departure, but they recapture the power of that person's present, what made them a gift from the beginning. So I've watched you be present. I've watched you listen to hear what it's like to live in their skin, to expand the circle, to find out how other people are doing, to learn the story about the person they loved so that they recapture those memories, the good memories. I've watched you uh, take food by. Um, Art Massey lost his wife, Anne, after 63 years of marriage, 62 years of marriage. Um, and when Emily and I dropped by the house to see them, uh, I was content to bring my presents. She brought pumpkin bread. Uh, it's a wonderful gift to have this simple thing that just said, this is for you. You're expanding the circle. You're not alone. Somebody's with you. And then what I've watched you do is before the event is over, you say, I love you. We love you. Church loves you. Something. Um, Paul, who wrote this letter to the Corinthians in three chapters, will write the love chapter in which he says, if I have faith to move mountains and understand all mysteries but have not love, I am nothing. I want to say the right word at the right time in the right way. I offer to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.